welcome to the Whistleblowers podcast. My name is David Simpson. We've got Damien Jarrett as well here with us and a special, special, special guest. We're delighted to be joined by former FIFA listed uh, and Premier League and First Division referee Keith Hackett. It's also the former GM of PGMOL and has a wonderful uh, history um, within the game at the top level as a referee and as someone in charge of referees. And we're so excited to have you. How are you doing, Keith? I'm fine. Great to be on your show. It's wonderful to have you. Um, I wanted to start off just with one thing. Having uh, been a FIFA-listed referee and worked at the, the top level of the international stage, is there one particular game, one particular event that stands out at the top, top level that you will never forget? I think when we start refereeing in England, uh, our ambition is one day possibly to referee at Wembley Stadium. And so for me, uh, being appointed to referee the 100th FA Cup final, um, Tottenham versus Manchester City, um, was a highlight. I mean, it, the, the game, the first game was a 1 1 draw. Uh, I didn't know whether I was going to referee the second game. Um, but coming down from the steps, having greeted the uh, Queen Mother, who was, the, the, if you like, there to present the medals, but didn't have that opportunity because of the draw. At the bottom of the steps, I was told, you're going to referee uh, the replay. So the replay is still played to this day on the basis of the Ricky Villa goal, the winning goal, 3-2. But really, um, the game that I, I, I sort of always revere is in 1979, as a fairly new referee to the, to the Football League, uh, I was appointed to referee the semi-final between Arsenal and Liverpool at Hillsborough, Sheffield, the city where I was born, where I lived, where I'd been a supporter. And as a child, my dad used to take me to the games. Um, we'd walk three miles, believe it or not. Uh, on the way, the halfway stop would be the pub. He would have a few beers. I would have an orange juice. And then we'd go to the game at Hillsborough. Um, in 79, uh, my father had passed, but I decided that where I used to live had been raised to the ground. All the terraced housing had been demolished. It was open field, really. I drove there, parked my car, got my bag out. I was wearing my FA blazer with pride, the FA badge. Walked the three miles to the ground. Wow. And, you know, I uh, didn't stop at the pub. But <laughs> nodded, it, to ask. <laughs> nodded it in appreciation as I passed. And, of course, as I got to Hillsborough, there were some Sheffield fans going to the game. Uh, and they, they're going, thought you were refereeing the match. Yes, I am. What are you doing here? Well, I'm walking with you to the match, to the ground. So, And then walking down the tunnel and onto a pitch where I'm now on the green bit, whereas before yeah. I'd always been there as a spectator. It was something special. Could you have refereed, because I know obviously now you can't obviously referee your team, right? So um, could you, have, would there have ever been opportunities in those days to referee your team? Or did they ever say, absolutely not, if you were a supporter, you couldn't referee? Well, it's interesting because um, Sheffield United, which is the other team in the city, remember that Sheffield has a great history in the game. Mm -hmm. Sheffield FC, still in existence, is the oldest football uh, team in the world. 1857 and the oldest ground in the world is not Sheffield FC uh, but it's at Hallam Sandygate and that's the oldest uh, football ground in existence they play in the Northern Counties East League um, to answer your question yes uh, not in a league competition but Sheffield United celebrated their centenary and I was asked to referee the game Sheffield United versus Sheffield Wednesday uh, it was never going to be a friendly. And in fact, uh, in that game, I had to send a Sheffield Wednesday player off. Uh, <laughs> I can tell you that my two lads' uh, sons were Sheffield Wednesday fans. And for a few days, they didn't speak to me. <laughs> That's awesome. They were disgusted with his dad, with the dad <laughs> sending off a Sheffield Wednesday player. That's hilarious. Yeah. It kind of, that's the one thing I don't know if I can speak for David of what he misses. But, you know, obviously, we're both in America now. And the one thing I miss 
terribly is you know i was a I'm a, i was a gillingham season ticket holder mm. um for for a long time some of it was with my dad some of it was with my girlfriend at the time um you know i met one of my girlfriends there and we went dated for five years and religiously went with each other so it's kind of that's such a big and that's the one thing i miss if it, i wouldn't go back to england uh no offense to england i just i yeah. just don't want to i love it here too much yeah. however that is like and when i first got to go back i emigrated in 2017 and covid hit right as um i was doing my first trip back to england in 2020 it was devastated mm. i had to can everything got cancelled i could mm. have still flown back in because i'm a citizen but there was just no point um mm. my grandfather died while i was out here well, we didn't get to go back it was a terrible time and yeah. the bit you know what the, then Gillingham got bought out by the Gallantson family. Paul Scally sold sold is still a minority shareholder, but sold the club as we were yeah. and we were rock bottom of the football league. Of yeah. December of twenty two, we're sitting here like, are we going to crash out the football league? And for Gillingham, that's almost unspeakable for a club of our stature mm -hmm. and where we've been. And um, and we get taken over, and I bite the bullet and I just buy a plane ticket for a long weekend trip to watch us play Leicester City in the third round of the FA Cup, which was coincidentally the first game the Gallantsons were, as the new owners were being introduced. And you know, I, I was overwhelmed because that's the one thing just going to the football with my dad, right? You know, mm. is just such a big thing. So I can definitely relate because just even just going back after five years of not doing yeah. that is insane. Yeah. So, yeah. well, yeah. I think that football. <sighs> However, whatever part we play in it, it's a disease. It, mm -hmm. It's something that there's no cure. Yeah, uh, it stays with us. We're passionate, uh, you know. And if there's a game on, we're going to watch it. You know. Sadly, I'm at the age now where I can't run around a football field, but I'm still heavily involved in football. I'm president of a non-league team. I'm also president of the league itself that we play in, and. Um, you know, uh, that connection with the game never leaves you. Yeah, awesome. And I noticed, um, Keith, you know, Keith, how we're all, and obviously David and I can explain a little bit of how we met Keith, is we're both in a group. And what, this is what I like about Keith, is he, and, and this is how we met Mark Halsey too, is they're giving back constantly. I mean, they're in a small little telegram group of 50 referees. And, you know, if we have a question, they're there to answer it, which is fantastic. Mm. So they're giving back to the grassroots, which mm. is phenomenal and i love to see it so david uh, do you want to take over again let me just say one thing that uh, throughout my career as a professional if you like unpaid professional referee uh i would referee and i can well remember refereeing west germany italy in the opening game of the 88 euro championships uh, and the following game would be was in fact Black Bull Taverners against the Angel, two pub teams on the Sunday. So throughout my career, even though I was Premier League and Football League and international games, I would always referee at grassroots level. That's awesome. So, so my aim always was to have a minimum of 100 games in a season. That was my target. Uh, because interestingly, and I'm you know, listening to David and the number of games that he, he's officiated, <laughs> hopefully, just like golf, the more you play, hopefully the better you become. Yeah. Knowledge is a great thing and experience is even better. And as you gain the experience, then you, you recognise that just knowing the laws is not just enough. It's actually managing the players, uh, dealing with the pressures that come from one man and his dog that might be stood at the touchline to maybe a hundred parents who are screaming and you're hearing every word up to the 120,000 that I experienced at Wembley or Azteca. Mm -hmm. it, it all has that mosaic that adds to your experience that hopefully makes you a better referee. Well, speaking of that, then the, the management side of the game, I, I know that, there are assigners here and referee coaches, as they're called here now. Mm. Um, they talk heavily about needing personality and having personality, being able to connect with players, coaches, other referees um, in order to uh, help you uh, have a rapport with them, but also hold respect um, um, for yourself in your authority stay. But I was going to bring up something with game management i think it was 1990 91 
Manchester United and Arsenal, there was a mm. massive brawl that happened in that game. Mm. And when you are faced with that level of lack of control where emotions are so high that people are hardly even thinking it's just a reactionary state how do you and what do you focus on in order to try and well restart a football match yeah and to also reconnect with the players to help them carry on with a football match and the referee team as well it's a great question and i, and I, I want to give you a broader answer because i think from that incident i learned and then use that experience if you like then to create a criteria of operation so there were 21 players it came from out of nowhere so it happened instantly uh, i'm six foot one at that time six foot two probably i piled in so i'm separating and i'm in the mix as a result of that the focus of what was happening was in a in a haze and I came off and suddenly realized, who am I going to send off here? Mm. And I'm a referee that operates with a great de degree of fairness. And, I, and, and this is the sort of thing you're talking to yourself as a referee. And I'm going, if I send him off, I've got to send him and him and him. So I'm easily now up to four or five people. This might sound crazy, but that's where the, the mind was going. Because I'm trying to execute fairness. And I suddenly realized all 21 could be sent off here, really. But I'm in the middle of a professional game at Old Trafford with a full house. So my view was in that situation, right, I'm going to take action that is not to, to caution anybody, not to send anybody off, but to actually make certain that my report to the authorities is going to be absolutely fair and detailed. The consequence of that was for the first time in English football, both clubs were severely fined and points deducted. Never before had any teams had points deducted. They also recognized and praised me for my fairness. Now let's go on a stage further because referees that are going to advance their career have to be proactive referees, not reactive, proactive. Part of managing and becoming better referees is to visualize and then determine what course of action should be taken. If any of you go onto the video, uh, um, onto YouTube, and look at the 1996 Carling Cup final uh, between Arsenal and Chelsea, Howard Webb was the referee. You'll learn from that experience, because I'm going to explain to you now what, what, we came, what became of that mass confrontation. Right. So, process changed. We never invited assistant referees to join us on the field of play. But I'm saying, in this situation of a mass confrontation, I'm the first thing I'm going to do is hit the whistle as hard as I possibly can and probably not get involved mm -hmm. physically, stand off and observe. Slowly, the referee, the assistant referee who's closer to the incident comes on the field of play as an observer, as a secondary referee, right? The third, the second assistant, who's probably at the technical area, his first line is to stop anybody entering from the field of play, but then joins me. So now, as a referee... The first thing I'm going to do now, as it's calmed down, is to start to think, who are the Reds? And issue the red cards. Did I get the perpetrator? Did I get the guy who reacted? Was it a punch? Was it a kick? Was it a stranglehold? How was it in war? So I then dismiss 
the first player. Let's say I'm going to dismiss two. We know that in that situation, if we're di dismissing a home and away fan uh, player, the away player goes first. And you allow distance. You don't go off, off. You wait. You watch that player go several yards away and then you issue the second red card and he goes. You then ask your assistant referees, are there any more red cards? When we come to this Carling Cup final that you're going to review, Howard Webb has already sent two players off and he asks his assistant, are there any more? And the assistant said, Bangalore, he's got to go. This player has got to go. So the, the third red card was issued. Mm. Then the yellows, the referee then gives the yellows. And finally, he asked his colleagues, are there any more yellows? Have I missed anybody? So you see how that becomes a process that's fixed in your own mind that says this is how to deal with a And the result of that was some years later, that with the professional referees and got, brought that process into play, it worked for Howard Webb in the 1990s yeah. Colin Cup final, where the two managers who entered the field of play without permission were first of all sent off, then three red cards, and then finally two yellows, one to each, one to the captains of both teams, funnily enough. So that that's how you have to evolve as a referee. That's when you're watching television and you're watching your colleague perhaps not performing that well or performing well, you do a SWOT analysis. If you, you know, you should sit watching a game of football with a with a with a piece of paper and say, "Oh, he's good at this. He's not very good at this." You know, look at the look at the fitness and movement. Um, I talked today, in fact, to a sports scientist because I said, in the period of my refereeing career, um, in the early stages, we didn't have sports science. We did our own training. And it was all about endurance. Can we last 90 minutes? And then as the cup competitions were coming in, can we last more? You know, you guys in America have tournaments mm -hmm. and you might do three games in a day. Yeah. That wasn't even in our psyche. <laughs> we one day, one game a day. So as a consequence, the training then with the pass back law, as we call it, past the goalkeeper, that suddenly changed the dynamics of the game and teams were getting fitter. And as a consequence, the old tra training regime changed from endurance to explosive sprinting, short burst speeds. Um, bring it, I brought in a running coach because our, the shape of a body of a referee is vertical because he wants to see mm -hmm. everything. And as a consequence, he becomes inefficient. We looked at with that running coach, uh, how efficient was their running style? You know, we have this nonsense, don't we, of referees having to run backwards. So we all suffer yeah. Achilles tendon injuries. You know, so I, I think those are the things that we can look at. Yeah, perhaps. that goes into a, a really good topic, David, because obviously, Keith, one of the topics we want to discuss, and we'll go straight into it, is you are – you were the head of the PGMOL and the guy that got referees to go full time. And that, mm. um, so, and fitness is, is a key thing we were going to talk about in that because, and this is what I try and say to people, especially when we're talking about MLS referees. Now only the top tier MLS referees here are, full, are a salaried full time, yeah. technically yeah. salaried employees. The, the, when you enter the MLS as a referee here, you are not salaried. You have to hold down a, full-time job to support your family you have to go home be a father be a husband or if you know if you're a female referee be a wife a mother and and you have to hold down a job and the stresses of everyday life on top of maintaining what is an elite level of fitness that is expected now of of, of referees um i i just did the regional fitness test which is just women's category one and that was pretty intense like as i yeah. get up the ladder if i go to try and go for national yeah that's men's category one that's a whole different i'm sure so yeah. you know so they've got to maintain that whilst also analyzing their games 
and then traveling wherever they're traveling around the country to go and referee. And that's incredibly tough. So, I mean, what do you, what would, what, so kind of how easy was it for you to get that change implemented and, and kind of what were the key fit factors that you were weighing up when you were doing it and kind of how, how to sell it to people? Well, first of all, I explained, um, you know, throughout my career, um, I was an amateur in a professional game and I had a job. I was, a, I was a sales and marketing director. And during that period, I'll tell you three stories very quickly. One, appointed to referee New Zealand versus Australia. I'd been with a company. I was a sales director. Uh, I'd taken the, the, the turnover of that business from three to three million to a hundred plus, very profitable. I was appointed to referee a World Cup preliminary game, Australia versus New Zealand, New Zealand versus Australia, sorry. And I came off the field and somebody said, to me, you've got to phone home. And I phoned home to, and was, was advised that I my job oh. because of football. That happened yeah. twice. And then I was appointed to referee uh, Stuttgart versus Fianord, a very tough European Cup game, where I was told very clearly that I'd been selected for this game for a reason. Um, and there was a board meeting there. And to get back, to be able to attend that board meeting, I had to pay £2,000 out of my own money to charter an aircraft to fly me back home ahead of a standard flight. So I used to get up in the morning at 6, 7 o'clock. In fact, I still do. But, I mean, I was up and then training and, and then go to work. And, and the fact is that because you were, taking time off, my holiday commitments were all taken off. So it was an easy thing that when I retired from referee, as an independent guy, I went to the Premier League and the FA, the chairman of the Premier League, and said, look, if you want, ref the game is getting quicker, the demands are greater on referees, Referees are no, no longer being given the free time by their employees. Uh, we need to go professional. And you need to invest. And that was a battle. But we won that battle. And uh, I was then asked, uh, would I manage the organisation? And they said, but what you've got to do is move from Sheffield, where you live, to London. Well, if you look at the price of houses in Sheffield, it was probably around about a quarter of a million. And I was going into um, London. It but been around about a million. Mm -hmm. So there was no way that I was going to take that job. But I said I'd be the development manager, part-time and help process. And I did that for about 18 months, two years. But as the development manager, I had more freedom. Yeah. And that's when Philip Don, a former Premier League FIFA referee, was, was the boss at the time. And then that's when I started saying, right, this is what we need to do. And so the first thing was to employ Matt Weston uh, as the sports scientist, full time. Uh, and we brought then order to the old, old regime. A simple thing like you do a warm-up before a game. You watch Premier League referees do a warm-up before a game. Um, that's what Matt Weston and I introduced. We, we introduced that warm-up process uh, as, as injury prevention. Mm -hmm. We introduced the new Polar Heart monitors. Um, and we gave, you know, the, the, the whole contract was about 43K. So they were getting 43,000. But we allowed work 20 hours a week the reason being that we weren't paying them a pension mm -hmm. and some of the referees were policemen and teachers school teachers on very good pensions and so they had to negotiate with their employers that they could work in their school for or police work for 20 hours a, a week that's what howard webb did chris foy alan wiley chris foy um they they had that negotiation to do and they did David Ellery was a schoolmaster at Harrow School. 
and didn't want to go full-time professional, but we wanted him on the team. So we made a special agreement with him. But, you know, some of those referees didn't even know how to use a laptop. And here's me saying, I want to provide them with polar heart monitors so that when they do their training and they train four times a week, they've got to download it and the scientist determines that that referee has done the training. Sudden, we were now dictating is the wrong word, but we were advising very strongly the, the training programs that they had to do high intensity, recovery, whatever it is. They would do that, download this, the, the heart monitor onto the laptop, email that to the sports scientist who would then tick it off. If they didn't do those training sessions, they wouldn't be appointed to games. Simple as that. Mm -hmm. And then I brought in a sports psychologist. I didn't pay them full time, but the sports psychologist, Professor Craig Mahoney, initially an Aussie, uh, now chancellor of a university, um, and and he would have conversations with them on you know on on various matters in terms of how to relieve stress and how to deal with conflict. Very I brought a vision, the, Professor Gail Stevenson worked with Manchester United and uh, I listened to a sports scientist about vision science. And so she came in and tested everybody and then gave some programs in terms of improving uh, peripheral vision. Um, and so, and then I introduced Prozone, which was a system used by Manchester United, Arsenal, very which uh, analyzed performance very in, in minute detail. But at the same time, I could have a video played and an animation of the game, circles, if you like, moving out across a, a football field. And that measured distance from ball, offside decisions, uh, speed of the, the movement of the referee, distance covered, various other things, all accurate. Mm -hmm. It's up to that point, as amateurs, um, we were dealing with perception and not reality. And in, and in any sport, you need to deal with reality. Yep. And so the depth was, for example, in those early years, we would average after 10 um, that to eleven and a half thousand in the in the Premier League, eleven and a half thousand referees in the Championship, what league below, would be doing twelve thousand meters per game, and up to a thousand meters and beyond would be at seven, a pace, a speed of seven meters per second. That's the sprint. Mm -hmm. I. So now we were able to look at ref out decision making, but positioning, movement. Uh, work rate, and with the sports psychology, psych psychology, uh, uh, player and sport. at times in the, in the tech, what's closely the interaction between referee and the like. You know, in those early years, it seems daft now. I went to watch a rugby match. Sport that I was interested in, what I really to know is how they communicate with each other because I did it on microphone. And I, within a month of watching that match, we had communication kits and um, we went through that process. You know, we, that learning curve. I can remember being at Chelsea and all of a sudden seeing a referee looking startled and looking around him. And when I went in at half time and said, What's the problem? Why, why did you suddenly stop? And he goes, well, I got a cab, a call for a cab to move from Kensington High Street to Oxford Circus. <laughs> um, so so we, we knew that we had to encrypt that, that uh, situation, which we did. Yeah. Um, later on, of course, we had the problem at Manchester United. Mark Plattenberg was the referee. And Carol, the Manchester United goal, 
goalkeeper drop the ball over the line. See, from I was sat in the director's box at Old Trafford. It was clearly over, but yeah. there was no chance. The, the referee, this was a snapshot. The referee is around the halfway line, correctly positioned. The assistant is with the secondary and most defender, maybe three quarters, of, uh, about a quarter away from the, the, um, mm -hmm. the halfway line. So they, they would have had to guess the, the, the decision. And so the summer conference, weeks later, I stood up at, at that conference and said, you know, asked Blue Sky thinking, what would you introduce? And I said, goal line technology. And then I spent several, well, a year we had the system working, but it took Blatter and FIFA a number of years before they approved it. Yeah. We wrote the criteria for it, but it works and it works very successfully. Um, and again, <coughs> The technical side of that is it has seven cameras around each goal. Uh, those are calibrated before the game. And uh, they operate at five cameras at 500 frames per second. And as a consequence, you get a, a very accurate decision. I laid yeah. the criteria down with Orkai. I said that, I don't, you know, he's saying, well, what should we do? Should we go through the assistant? Should we, should we say, you know, he flags? And I went, no, all I want. Is a signal to the referee's goal, nothing else. Yeah. And so, so I'm not going to get into too much detail on that. And I know that there's a semi automated system using its own cameras as against broadcast speed cameras. I know that that process could, can definitely be improved in terms of offside decisions. Yeah. And, and we get a quicker result. Um, but you know, linked with that, you know, the complication is that we've had law changes that um, I find uh, I find it difficult as to why, when trying to simplify a law, uh, they complicate it. Uh, and I'm digressing slightly because I, I, I occasionally pull this book out. Um, you might see that it, it's actually 1936 mm -hmm. of the game. And, and, you know, in England, we're having a constant dialogue about handball, as you probably are in America. Yep. Here's the law in, in 1936. A player shall be penalised if he intentionally handles the ball, i.e. carries it, strikes or repels it with a hand or arm mm -hmm. that's, that's it, it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we just sat down um in massachusetts so we just sat down with um we're very lucky uh the head of pros player like senior referees alan kelly is is lives in oh, massachusetts. I know alan very well yeah so we were very i was very fortunate a few weeks ago to sit at gillette stadium in a in a clinic with him on handball and it was it was just it was very entertaining because again like just the different opinions on everything and we're just sitting there like you know it, you know and you just i'm just sitting there like is it deliberate i just want to know if it's deliberate or not that's all i care about did he deliberately do it no like what well, this unnatural unnaturally bigger and the different perceptions of what unnatural is yeah. has just delved into complete mess and and, well, and I mean, then, I, I, you know. yeah i mean i mean the the scenario is that it, it's easy to sit around a table and write a law, relatively speaking. Um, but what it's failed to take into account is the actual physical movement, body mechanics of a mm -hmm. player. And therefore, if you spin, you you know, any object, if you have a hard object with, with sort of ropes hanging from it, the ropes will go out naturally. And the arms are the same, similar. They're used for balance. Yeah. And so as a, as a consequence, instead of making the game easier for, to referee, they make it more difficult. And of course, a lot of the changes are, 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 are focused on the elite level of football. Uh, they forget that not every game's got assistant referees. Uh, quite often you've got club officials helping you in the decision-making process. Uh, you know, and it, it's, it's the same with offside. Uh, a deliberate play. Uh, yes, you can make a judgment. You know what's important, and what I did at the PGMOL was we would almost on a weekly basis, when the referees were together, 
we would show those uh, contention, contentious decisions on a big screen and talk talk through, even with the referee. You know, we'd say to the referee, "Okay, come on, uh, don't worry about whether you got it right or wrong. I want you to get it right, but let's talk yeah. through your process first of all. How did you come to that penalty kick?" Yeah. Um, and you know when the video when the video is is showing a simulation, um, and then we get into the realms of it in the round, the law, um, the 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 actual physical contact, the manufactured contact by the forward going forward, the point at which he's falling, is the hands go out, um, and it, and it, is it an act of simulation or is it a foul? And I, and I think those are the those are part of a group discussion and workshops are ideal where you can actually get a better a better flow of information and come out of that group hopefully agreeing this is how you're going to uh, adopt that approach in future i think thankfully we did alan said at the start he was like i'm not sure if we're all going to be leaving this agreeing or, or not but i think we did come to a consensus he he's figured out a way to at least get us because that is one of the things david and i have both talked about this, haven't we, David? About there are things as a group we're just not consistent on, and we admit that uh, we're not consistent on the application of handball in games. Um, the amount of times I've refereed a game, the coach says, "Well, I got get, I got that last week." I'm like, "Well, you're not getting it with me." Like, you know, it's, <laughs> it's like that's not handball. Um, so I don't, David. You want to speak to some of your experiences with that? But yeah, that's. Um, but we came away from that clinic a lot better, thankfully. Alan's a good teacher. Well, I think that there are a number of laws that. Um, that create discussion and debate. You know, we, we've had this debate in England about the the amount of, ad, of playing time in a professional game. You know, we, we had a couple of seasons ago, we had a game that was only 45 time. About 55 minutes. So a 90-minute game, get 55 minutes. Uh, this is why I'm... I, I've always in, been in favour of an independent timekeeper or a, a stop clock, as we see in other sports. Um, the reason being that the fan has to have a degree of value for money. Um, and he's, he's obviously not getting that. And that's exaggerated by the fact that you can have um, top team, let's, let's say this is Liverpool, going for the... Going for the... Uh, the championship, and you could have a team at the bottom or near the bottom, and they're going to play at Anfield. Um, so that team comes with the intentions of playing the least amount of football possible in order to try and secure a draw. Not an all-out going for a win, but tactically then stopping the opposition. And, and then you can get a negative, unentertaining game. But as a referee, you've got to be aware of that. You've got you've got to be aware that um, who are the subs and how a substitution can create a different phase of play by way of attitude. You know, the manager's been winding, the coach has been winding this player up to say, look, come on, get some enthusiasm. And that 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 wind up is such that this player decides he's gonna is going to either commit yellow or red card offences. So substitutions and stoppages in the game are, are a time when referees have to become more alert because those are the times when problems can occur. Yeah. And this is this is one of the the risky areas of VAR when the referee leaves the scene of a potential problem uh, to go and view the monitor. So with you saying with you saying that then in because I know VAR discussions, it's almost, it's a daily thing. I mean, you go on any social media and it's it's, I mean, it's constant. I mean, people want it out of the game, which it's not going to happen, but people want it changed. People want it tweaked. It's been an ever, it's been an ongoing trial period, really is what it feels like, because it's just constantly new, adapted uh, um, approaches. And it seems like the 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 way that, they're being told, at least in the Premier League, they there are certain things that they will not get involved with, and there are things they will get involved with, and it it it, it muddies the water for the general fan who is the watcher, who is 
the player, the person that you want to have their value for money and to have a great experience within the game. So if, if VAR is never going to go away and it's going to be an ever evolving system, where 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 what where does it have to go? I know you said the other oh yesterday even that you said it, it feels like it's a safety net for referees. It's an easy yellow card to give in something that may be a red, but you give the yellow just to cover yourself and then let VAR confirm justify your decision. Um, in speaking with the it was I think it was in reference to the Mason Holgate challenge, yeah. but I I. I, I, we don't know. We talk about this all the time, and we just don't know how many more adjustments you can make for it to be a system that works, similar to something like cricket. As people reference rugby all the time, and the open communications that there are. There seems to be a little bit of pushback from the people in charge about that, legal reasons, etc. Are there just that many more factors in football, or is it really much, much simpler? Like you said, simplify it and a lot of problems go away. I think that uh, I have my views in terms of VAR. I'm, I'm for technology. But I think that, um, you know, I recognize that technology fails. And it fails because it's not being evolved in the right manner. First of all, we look at the offside situation at the moment, not the semi-automated system, but the offside as it's currently running in the Premier League and I think in the MLS. Um, it's too slow because it's 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 using it's it's using broadcast cameras to execute um, a decision, and there's no way that that current system, right? is going to give you the exact time that the ball is being played. When we go to AI, it's, it gives you that. It's got the points on every player, and it's also got the points in the ball, or the object in the ball that says it's kicked. And at that point, there's a, there's a, a memory shot that says this player's in an offside position. We know that being in an offside position is not an offence. Mm -hmm. And then that's why it's semi-automated. So we speed up with that level of accuracy. I'm for technology, having been the guy that introduced communication kits and ProZone and various sort of yep. things and, and goal line technology. You also have to recognize that that technology can impair the entertainment. And at the moment, that's exactly what it's doing. And therefore, I'm, I'm not so sure that we can ever say that that technology is going to stay with us forever. Because I think there's too many people now having their entertainment ruined because of the way the VAR system is being operated. Now, in your country, I think because you were the first to have VAR, I think it's been operated pretty successfully. But it's also been... A degree of transparency with the with the weekly review shows. Yeah, that um, was always there. Yeah. And 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 even the video on the screen inside the stadium when it was being introduced and how it was going to be introduced mm -hmm. and what it, what it was looking for. I think that was based on the fact that American sports have already got systems in place. Yeah, that, that allow you as an American supporter to say, um, yeah, we we enhance and embrace technology. Over here, um, I, I think that we've got several problems. The problems are mainly, okay, I'll, I'll move away from the technology regarding offside because I think semi-automated system has to be introduced. I now want to look at the, the individuals. First of all, having, a v, uh, having an elite referee officiating a game on a Saturday in the middle of an intense Premier League game. Um, and then on Sunday being VAR. It's just not on. This is a professional environment. You know, um, two shows in a weekend doing two different jobs is not a, not a good show. Mm. 
So the change I would make, first of all, is that, first of all, I would, I would look to have an independent panel of VAR specialists. This is what they do in the World Cup. So I'm not being outrageous here. They have VAR specialists and they train them. And, you know, you, you don't expect a pilot to be the stewardess. No. They're the pilot. And they're trained to be the pilot. And, uh, and every time they fly the plane, they get better, hopefully. Their experience is a great gain. No different in refereeing. The more you referee, the better you become. So I think that asking a referee to be a... Uh, to do something else is not on. That makes a lot of sense. No, that then, you've got the sec- then you've got the second bit. So here you've got your number one referee, whoever that is. And let's say you've got 20 referees in the Premier League. I'm just giving this as a, a number. So you've got number one as a referee and you've got number 20, the new boy least experience, VAR. How willing is that that guy, that new boy, to say to his his, his partner on the field of play, you got that wrong, mate. You need to have another look. I think so the relationship between <coughs> VAR and referee is mixed. Yeah. It's interesting. I want to touch on something you talked about, and that was that in America we are more attuned to video review we've been doing it a long time in american football and in all kinds of sports um and that was a really because so in the mls generally they haven't even introduced lines in the mls in the past the mls just did the eye test it's like can we see that this is a clear and obvious offside yes okay great we'll deal with it no we're just leaving it as it is and you talk about the the semi-automated part of it um i was saying this to david before the show um, and this, like, I, I reference cricket and the LBW rule, right? Where they said, look, if half, if not more than half the ball is impacting the stumps, we're not going to change the umpire's call because otherwise, why do we even have an umpire there? We'll just use this technology and we'll know when they're out and that's it. And so I, me as, and this is me taking my referee head off and just being a fan of the game now. I don't want, even with semi, whether it's semi-automated or they took one minute, two minutes, three minutes to draw these silly lines that everyone's getting infuriated with. Um, I don't want a toe being offside to negate a goal if the oh, AR well, didn't put his flag up. I don't want yeah. that to happen as a fan of the game. So why did we go that far to correct something when I don't think that's was it the was it the players and coaches? Did they have they kind of made their own bed here? I don't how's how did that happen? Because I don't want to see that regardless. Um, I, I think that it, it, it's come about because I'm not so sure that those people that make the decisions ultimately are the ones that have actually had the practical experience of running up and down a football field. <laughs> um, yeah. and, I, and I think um, I, I use the analogy of, a, you know, in England, 30 miles an hour, we have a speed limit, say 30 miles an hour. The good cop, is the one that says at 31, I'm going to have a word. Maybe at 32, I'm going to have a word. Hey, go into a fire or what's your problem? Um, look, I've made the point and disappears. Um, 33, he gets a red card. Mm-hmm. So for me, I think that common sense has suddenly been drawn out. And I know that people will say, well, just a minute, common sense give stretch and too much stretch. You know, early in the Premier League PJ Marl days with Philip Don in charge, um, Philip talked about clear daylight between the attacker and defender. And it worked very, very successfully. Um, when we start talking about a toe offside, then we, it becomes a nonsense. And we're talking about a toe offside where the camera speeds and the system is not good enough to yeah. give us that. You know, I, I, I take a loaf of bread and slice it a hundred times. And in that middle portion, when you're looking, the gap is so small 
you're going to get a more accurate picture than say 50 slices where you might pull a slice and it's not even there. Yeah. So the use of technology is how you use the technology to be in a situation where, and I think AI, all I, all I let us win the trust of fans yeah. and players and managers by saying, look, we're using artificial intelligence. We're using our own camera systems like goal line technology. Yeah. It's going to give you a decision, accept it. Yeah. Makes and, and, it and it becomes automatic. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, you know, I, yeah, I did, I did say, I wrote an article in the Daily Telegraph beginning of the week because I liken it, I likened the VAR system and particularly the referee to a tightrope walker. If you've got no safety net, believe me, every stride that you take, you're focused, you're concentrating, which is so vital in referee. Having that focus, having that awareness, what is the next move? What's going to happen next is part of the process of referee. Um, so we have no safety net. We take great care in our decision-making process. But what we've suddenly introduced is a safety net. And, you know, just like the tightrope walker with a safety net, it doesn't, he's, he gets careless. He doesn't, he doesn't mind if he, if he misses his next step and falls off. The net's going to catch him. So what has evolved is I've, I've witnessed referees, many of them change and go defensive rather than actually rule from the heart. This is a feel, a touch. It's, the more you do, the better you become. And you, you, you're passionate about the game. But what we've got is we've got hesitancy around penalty kick decisions. You know, this is... This is like the ice cream man trying to sell ice cream with no bells and whistles. He drives around the streets or the highway, whatever, stops occasionally, but nobody attends and he opens up and says, why is nobody coming and buying my lovely ice cream? Mm. Because he's not playing the bells. Yeah. And, and, I, and, and, you know, I think that referees, we're in the selling game. And part of that selling game is body language, yeah. a whole subject that we can get involved in at some stage, and how you, sell, how you sell your decision. Any form of hesitancy is signaling to everybody else that you're not sure, you're doubtful. And, and I've seen in recent months referees who in the past have been good decision makers, that's why they've got there onto the Premier League, suddenly become hesitant. Mm -hmm. The VAR is going to pull me out of the mire. And, yeah. and this is what you don't want in referee. And so it's, it's at the moment in time, the way it's operating in England, I've been it. Yeah. I'm that strong. And I'm the guy that actually brought, believes technology is there to support referees. But I think it's not helping referees at the moment. And that's because I think the criteria in the process is not as firm as it should be. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, however you uh, affect a law on the field of play, if you're the elite group of referees in that country, just like Europe, UEFA, have their elite referees, their elite panel, UEFA are strictly, strictly at educating, advising their referees on how decisions in given certain circumstances, how the result of that decision will be given. Mm -hmm. And that's no different. That should be the process ongoing. Yeah. You know, you want consistency of that much referee, but you want a consistency across the group. What you what you're getting here is you're getting on the same same sort of action over a weekend, a similar action, you're getting two different responses. Yeah. I gotta, you know, I gotta, and this weekend, you know, at the Sheffield United game, we had a referee in a good position. He had a good view. Um, and he issues a yellow card for what is, you know, I'm not being clever. This is, this was a, a really bad challenge. 
that, that was reckless, excessive force. You didn't need to read it as a referee. We're talking about an elite referee here giving a yellow card to an absolutely nailed on red card. Do you think he was unsighted a little bit looking at his position no. on that? You don't think he was? No, That's I why didn't. I had that question. Because we no, were talking about that when we were talking about the decision we were saying. Yeah. Was he unsighted? Look, I, 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 position and viewing angle is the criteria of how you move around the field of play. And uh, this, is, this is one of our fittest referees. Atwell is a, is a fit mobile referee. Um, and normally he's the one that goes red side of yellow. No, he's not a guy who's afraid mm -hmm. of sending people off uh, or yellow carding them. So when you actually look at this, you suddenly begin to wonder why, why is an elite referee uh, given a red card? Yeah. And that needs to be examined in more detail. Because if he says, I was out of position, I want to know why. Yeah. I want I want to know why on a breakaway he's not not in a good position. Because I often say to referees, I want proximity to play because that helps sell decisions. But when you're in a position where you need a viewing angle, you give up distance to get the angle. Yeah. And so if, if he if he was caught looking down a tunnel, the tunnel and the body was covering, <coughs> then ultimately that's still poor refereeing. Yeah. But those are the things that you examine with the individual referee. I thought he was in a good position. I think the reading of it was clear. I mean, uh, I wasn't being wise after the event, seeing 15 replays. Mm. It was one from the heart that says he's got to go. Yeah. No, um, I got a quick question because you've been talking about we've been talking about professionalizing your know, full-time referees mm -hmm. um there's a big debate obviously i'm 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 more of an efl guy because gillingham have always been in the efl we've been a league one league yeah. two yo-yo club a yeah. little bit in the championship um and and there's a real emphasis obviously for people that don't know obviously you <laughs> have the two select group lists right um yeah. and the referees that are generally in the middle at the championship level are also select group officials that have retainers that are full-time. However, you get in the league one and league two, and those are your nationalist referees. Yes. And these guys are not full-time. Um, they are part-time officials. They hold down nine to five jobs as we yeah. talked about in the show. The amount of money that's trickling down to these levels now that we're seeing, I mean, you look at the people that just took over Gillingham, obviously, who who owns Wrexham now, like in League Two. The amount of money that's trickling down even from the Premier League into these divisions, um, and then with the broadcast rights expanding, is it about time we start looking at these officials and saying, like, you don't have to give them 70,000 pounds. That's a top 10% salary in the UK, right? You don't have to necessarily give them 70K, 100K. But is it time to bring those guys in on 30? 30,000 pounds is a very good salary, base salary to be on in the UK. Is it about time we brought those guys in and said, here's 30,000 pound retainer, we're expecting you to be full time. And that may even improve their career progression, you know, out, out you know, op options potentially. Is it about time we start looking at it at that level too, because of the complaints that we're seeing from fans, from managers, teams, and whatnot? It's a good question. Um, see, if, if, if I think when you certainly when we started the, the PGMOL, we had uh, about 24 referees that we selected, carefully selected. There were 24 of the best. We knew that we were giving them contracts. We knew that they would come under employment law that once giving them a contract, if they if they didn't meet that criteria, we then know that we had a tough job to offload them if they didn't meet the standards that we yeah. expected. We have SG2, which is the championship referees. I viewed that as a scenario in my time because SG2 was introduced when I left the role, retired from the role. Um, I had a group that were development referees in that sense. And for me, they were two year, they, they had a two year cycle in that, in that program. So we had 
20 referees at, at the SG1 and we had something like 40 odd in the rest. But we also within that had about 10 development referees on a two year cycle. Those that hit the top level were retained and those that were not making it standard wise move back down and that also applied to sg1 by the way mm. so we had people you know we had an international referee and i i watched his performances deteriorate and this, you know he was comfortable he he was now instead of going to mcdonald's for a meal was going out to michelin star restaurants twice a week and all and start putting weight on and all those sorts of things and I had, I had that choice of, of saying, right, okay, you either improve. If you don't improve over a given period, then I'm going to offload you, which I did. Because this is no different to having a sales team and that salesman not reaching his budget figures. Yeah. I, I think that uh, it's, it, it really is what the game can afford to some degree. You're right about the money. Mm. But, you know, if I told you that, the budget that I operated with was five million, and uh, and that budget currently is twenty six million. You can see the massive growth, but have we seen a massive growth in performance? How many world class referees have we got in England? You know, uh, these are the questions to ask. Mm -hmm. I think the chase has to be that if, if there is a system that recognizes talent and coaches and develops talent and accelerates that process of that guy getting through to the very highest level, that has to be the case. But you've yeah. also got to be tough to say your existing guy, right? If his standard of performance is not meeting the criteria, then he has to understand or she that 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 role is going to be taken away from them they're mm -hmm. going to be demoted bumped down to league one league two kind of thing well exactly yeah. 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 kind of the same way that's i always wonder you could have had it the same way as we have now promotion relegation right you know system well i mean it's, referees. It, it should be no different <laughs> yeah it would be you the know, same. one of the one yeah. of the things is that you know it, it, there are some referees who uh, aspire and make fifa and then don't go on mm. you know they 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 come off because they they're not reaching that level of expectation. So I, I think that one of the problems you've got is you haven't got to get into the quantity game. You've got to get into the quality. Mm -hmm. But you've also got to have a succession planning system that recognizes talent, that, that can drive that talent forward. And, you know, no matter what, what referee you're at, at what level, you can be the number one referee in England. You have to drive that referee to have, a, have ambition. You know, when I, when I coach the likes of, of Webb, Clattenburg, Halsey, Paul, uh, they would tell you that how demanding I was of them. You know, that I would tell them, very clearly the good points in their in their game and then i would dwell on those that where they needed to be improved yeah you know it, you know let me use the analogy of a formula one car it wins the race in monaco and guess what they don't keep that car as it is they take it to bits and they change it again yeah and then they start fiddling around, preparing it for the next game. This is what referee's about. You're as good as your next game, not the one you've gone. And you've got to have the same level of focus and concentration in that game. Let me let me tell you, I had one referee. He was a 75-minute referee. He was as good as any referee I'd got on the list. But in the last 15 minutes, you know, his performances did. And we couldn't put a handle on it. We, we really examined why. Uh, was it a health issue? Uh, you know, was it, was it fatigue coming in early? Did we need to ensure that they 
they had the right drink at half time with appropriate acolytes in that that maintain that momentum and fitness level. Could we supplement something to to help that that performance? Um, it's concentration. It was mental. It wasn't physical. Mm-hmm. And so the sports psychologist came up with the idea of of this guy having a rubber band on his wrist. And his assistant would say at 75 minutes, flick the band, flick the band. And that little bit of pain was just a signal to say, you get in the game. And we'd resolve that issue. That's, that's crazy. That's a great story. <laughs> you know, there, there are small things that you yeah. can do. You know, I say to young referees now, I mean, I coach a few around the world and I said, right, okay, the first thing I want you to do is a diary. I want that diary and I want you to record every match, not every minute. I want you to highlight the the three positives and the two negatives from that game. How did you feel? Um, What did you eat before the game? Mm. Was it a, a curry followed by apple pie and cream? Or was it the right nutritional yeah. value? What actual food intake and when before a game actually gives you a performance ability that's really good? So you have to get into that nutrition element. And if your members, you know, the, the listeners here want anything to do with nutrition, I'll send I'll send you a book and you can have it. You can distribute it, whatever, by way of an electronic uh, yeah. detail. You know, it's a, it's a commission document, a few years old now, by the professor at uh, Loughborough University, sports science, and and it's tailored to what referees' uh, nutrition book. You know, um, I say to young referees immediately after the game, you're in recovery now. Yeah, uh, I want you to eat jelly babies or uh, jaffa cakes. I, I because, still have those at half time. Jaffa cakes at yeah. half time are my thing. Right, so, yeah. because they've got gelatine in, so they, yeah. they they help the recovery process. Uh, so there are little things like that, but but you measure the performance. You know, if you've got a smartwatch or whatever, you you can actually log the distance you've covered. Yeah. And even the speed profiles. We're actually going to be uh, talking to Ref Six because I'm a big Ref Six user. That has that's helped my game tremendously. Ref Six. Well, and they, I mean, I'm going to be getting David into that. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, what what you're getting is you're recording your performance, yeah, and that, and then you're analysing your performance through self analysis, and then you're actually on a path of improvement. Mm-hmm. Um. In the same way that I talk about smart objectives, specific, measurable, achievable, related over time. Um, <clears throat> and those, those are short-term, medium, and long-term objectives. Yeah. It's no good saying, um, you know, uh, week one of my career, I want to be an MLS referee. Week one of my ref- career, I want to referee a football match. Yeah. And then I want to improve. So I think it's 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 setting those smart objectives is important within yeah. refereeing. Hundred percent, David. Do you want to go into the next question? I think uh, you got a list of stuff. But which, which, what do you want to take a pick from? I was going to reference the uh, the uh, the blue card. Oh yeah, discussion <laughs> that's being talked about. I know blue cards <laughs> have been used in the UK at lower levels at grassroots. We over here haven't used them on on any level at all it's a brand new idea concept that will break the us at some point um when we when we do usually non-sanctioned and adult leagues things like indoor games and things like that we use yellow cards as a blue card the player is sin binned for two minutes the team plays down two minutes there are different variations of it um what are your thoughts on the possibility well, of a blue card application at the at the highest levels of the game. Right. Let, let us talk about what happens in England with grassroots because we operate the sin bin. Mm-hmm. And the sin bin is, is for one thing only, and that's dissent. And it's down to the referee when he uses it. And and I it's been very successful. No question. It has a deterrent. One of the things that's happened in the game at the highest level and cascading down 
is that a value of a yellow card has been devalued. That, that word warning to improve your behavior has been lost in the yellow card. Or caution, the word caution too. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, yeah, exactly that. Because what, what you find is that um, we've been using it extensively and therefore the players have got used to it. And within the, tech, within the coaching scenario, let's take one for the team, becomes part of the debate. Um, and then, you know, in Europe, when I operate as a referee in Europe with the yellow cards, two, when I mean two, two in two, two or three games, mm -hmm. they were suspended. Mm -hmm. We have five in England before mm -hmm. they even consider suspending. And our average yellow card count in the last couple of years has gone from an average of three closer to five. Um, because of a clampdown on dissent, which lasted about six weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so for me, the value of a yellow card is not having the impact on players that it should have. Should have. So for me... The sim bin has worked, but then all of a sudden, instead of saying what has happened at grassroots level, we're now going to introduce in the professional game under experiment, they suddenly announced we're going to have a blue card. And that that detracts from all, and we're going to do, have it for cynical fouls as well. And and I just, I just, I should have, because if they're going to introduce it for or, or for, for cynical fouls, he should have done that at grassroots level. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we should have seen how, because I, I actually feel like that's going to be a disaster. If that happens, yeah. when they trial it, the cynical is, is too subjective as to what a cynical foul is to a referee. Well, I mean, effectively, one can only say that it's it's a foul that stops a promising attack. Yeah, which yeah. we already have a yellow card for. So, Correct. But again, what they're trying to yeah. do is they're trying to say, we, we want to increase the punishment for that tactical ploy, and mm. therefore that's 10 minutes in the sim bin. That 10 minutes is going to be, you know, um, lost to that player, and it becomes a team punishment as well as a, an individual punishment. So I get I get the grass, I get the sim bin idea. Yeah. I also recognise that technically at the, the elite level, coaches are much more sophisticated. So what we'll do is we'll have a we'll have a clamp down from that team, for want of a better word. That player, that team, suddenly with one man off in the sim bin, plays differently. Yeah. The injuries get worse, the stoppages get slower, yeah. and all it slows goes. the game. It just slows the whole game down. And therefore, this is where I think it's not thought through. If, you know, if they said, you know, they, they should have said, right, we, we've used it in Outer Mongolia and it's been very successful, so we're introducing it into another five continents or five leagues or whatever, fine, if those leagues want to accept it. I think the way that they announced the blue card was uh, kite flying and uh, it was shot down. Yeah. And now they've given themselves a problem. Yeah, because the negativity around it is is sad to see. Because I don't think you know if if you're involved at the elite level, surely you know that you know it's here and ounds here. We, mm -hmm. You know whatever we do in law changes, the coaches will find a way around it. That's what they're paid to do. Yeah, but I think there's already things that need to be resolved. I think handball law needs tidying up. I think the 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 playing around with offside and what's deliberate play and toenails and all that goes with it, get that right and get yeah. that sorted. They haven't reported on it a lot, but offside's actually been going through a trial. Uh, you know, Arsene Wenger has been working with FIFA to talk about we're going to be more like kind of for Americans to understand the kind of the blue line in hockey, right? As long as you have a foot on the blue line before that puck enters their zone, you're good. So mm -hmm. they're saying the same thing. As long as you have a foot in line with the last, that second to last defender, you'll be good. They're ex they're experimenting with that right now, whether yeah. I'm not sure well, because, or if I like that. Well, but... Arsene Wenger was in this country when we operated daylight. 
Yeah. So he's <laughs> so he's tried, but that hasn't even got any attention in the media. That that's actually have we've been trialing that. That has been under trial. Whether it creeps up will obviously depend on the trial and what people say about it. But um, yeah, I I I think the whole process is clear. If they're thinking of introducing a law change, then with that law change, they should experiment yep. for a couple of years. They should bed it in. They should write the law very specific and the criteria of operation very specific. And then the coaching and education of all aspects, the stakeholders in the game should be very clear and concise. Yeah. You shouldn't be able to, you shouldn't allow a, an introduction of a like handball and then suddenly a region says, we're going to, we're going to interpret this in this way. Yeah. They should, everybody should interpret in the, in the appropriate manner. Um, so yeah, I, I, to answer the question, I understand clearly that they want to look at increasing the punishment on dissent right because of all sorts of shenanigans that we're seeing in the game around the world um i think the punishment shouldn't be financial but i think we're leading towards you know if uh, if you have six yellow cards in a game uh you get a one point deduction mm -hmm. let's see how that goes yeah yeah yeah, in the in the play in the reality react when five yellow cards have yeah. been given. Well, in NFHS, which is the high school, um, you know, governing body here in the US, um, you know, depending on this now in our state, every state sets this, but they have a 15 yellow card or 15 card limit on all their teams. If you get yeah. 15 or more cards, you don't qualify for the state tournament. Your team is out. It doesn't matter whether you went unbeaten. You guys aren't playing the playoffs this year. And Good on you. Yeah, and and that's fifteen. And I can tell you something. I, you know, and of that, you know, I I think that's had tremendous success. It really yeah. helps us as referees. I I haven't had to deal with a lot of dissent at the high school level with you know these 18, 17, 16 year olds playing. You know, uh, sometimes at a very high level, and I haven't had it because they're always wary. Their coaches in the head, look, guys, we get fifteen, and they're playing. You know, that works out like a card a game. It's not a lot. Yeah. They're playing fifteen yeah, or twenty yeah. games a year. Well, so well, yeah. yeah. They've, they've put value back into the yellow card. That's yeah. The well, and the other point, the other point, the other point with the yellow card, and I, I don't know what it's like state by state because every state is kind of different. But in yeah. Pennsylvania, if you get a yellow card in a high school game, you leave the field for five minutes. Yeah. You know, you're off. And so. Which is, which is effectively a sin bin. Exactly yeah. right. Exactly yeah. right. But you don't, you don't hurt the team. They were allowed to substitute, right? We Correct. sub them out. And we do that here. Like it's an automatic sub, like in our state, there isn't a time limit on that when he can come back in, but it's an automatic sub. The player has to go off. We stop the clock. The yeah. player goes off. We sub yeah. someone else in. He can't come in till next stoppage. I, like, you know, I, I think ultimately at the end of the day, we, this is, this is about, coaching and training referees to be proactive to be effective man managers to understand body language and what that means um, and uh, with that level of training and that level of uh, accountability for the for the match officials ultimately at the end of the day the competition then has to protect its officials by having the appropriate sanctions that that it that promote better behavior on the yeah. field of play. Yeah. And, and you know, ultimately, at the end of the day, I, I when I was boss of the PGMOL, I always knew the responsibility that I had to the grassroots game, you know? And, and what's amazing is that if, if there is a level of strictness within the referees in terms of application, I, I don't mean you know, a, a more proactive approach and 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 uh, managing the event more effectively, um, then the game itself becomes better. Mm. You know, we, we're in danger of promoting defensive referees here. By that is, um, you know, I, I, we've seen in, in a number of occasions here in England 
we have seen some advantages played that have resulted in some wonderful goals, but we've also seen interference with the game, with the referee not applying an advantage, mm-hmm. not putting his risk, his control at risk, and as a result, that's debilitated uh, some of the the outcomes. You know, so that all that all logic of of how you manage a game, how you referee a game, it's part of the debate and discussion. And, and I think, sadly, um, the law changes have, have, have increased the difficulty for match officials at all levels. I'm not just saying that England suffers with handball. You have to say, why aren't FIFA and the IFAB next month, when they meet in Scotland, why aren't they sitting around a table with a business group saying, look, handball is creating confusion rather than actually saying it's it's perfectly all right it, it look if you read it you can understand it that's theory yeah once you apply it that's, that's the practical that's, side yeah yeah um, it is tough. Yeah. it is yep yeah. um I w- we wanted to touch on something we were talking about this before you came in as well uh, we've seen you've been commenting on it today mark clattenberg new the new position that that which i'm astounded looking into it it doesn't seem like this has been done a lot because so in american sports and i'm a big nfl fan um we hear coaches talk about all the time how they analyze referees right uh what flags they throw more than particularly others and that impacts their game plan where they like you know and you know obviously in soccer different or football sorry it's just the americanisms creeping in um you know we it it isn't actually very common it seems like mark clattenberg's getting a lot of flack for this but i'm sitting here going well not i think it's a smart thing by nottingham forest i think if they can find ways that by preparing for their the referee crew they have they can change their game style or their game plan to make to help them that's a smart only a smart thing i think we've all heard these stories of forest sending letters to the pgmol right well it's got to be a lot better for Mark Clattenburg to be the middleman there, helping them talk to the P. It, I only see good out of this, but it feels like he's catching. And I think you commented on the flak by Philip Neville, right? Um, why is he catching someone? This seems like a smart move for everyone. I think behind it, we've got to recognize two things. First of all, Mark Clattenburg was the head of Greek referees for a period, uh, and then he was moved on but he was moved on with a two-year contract by the Super League in the hope that they were going to introduce professional referees. And the chairman of the Greek Super League is the same man that's the owner of Nottingham Forest. So there's that behind that. Having said that, on a number of occasions, I've been consulted by football clubs to advise them on appeals on red cards. And on some occasions... (laughs) I've actually said to them, you're wasting your time. That is a clear red card, and this is why it's a red card, and this is the law, and the referee's correctly applied the red card, and nothing's happened since. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's been a few occasions when you've been able to outline, for example, the law on serious foul play to provide and produce important stills from the game incident to explain, you know, when you see a player with both feet off the ground, one foot forward, if need be, that at that point, tell me how he stops, tell me how he changes directions. Uh, He's therefore out of control to actually be able to say, this is the speed at which he's moving. Uh, So many feet per second. You know, you, you're you're dealing with excessive force. What is it? Yeah. Uh, you can then put in the distance and the approximate weight of the player, and you've then got the the uh, the, the formula that gives you the the impact yeah. uh, power. Um, so, for me, because I have great knowledge of those referees, you know, with some of the referees that. I saw them at a, a young age and targeted them and said these these guys had the potential to come through. You gain that skill set through your own experience and then watching referees uh, and then understanding the weaknesses of those cases. 
So, yeah. So Fred Smith is appointed to our game on Saturday. Fred Smith doesn't manage 9.15 that effectively. You know, in, in the last five games, he's used the spray can twice. He's not achieved 9.15. And the systems are very easy to throw up the, the detailed analysis of this referee's weaknesses mm -hmm. um, and also his strengths. And the guy can influence. Where does he fatigue? Yeah. You know, if you if you track if you track someone, uh, you know, I've got analysis. If you track referees, um, oh, it's interesting how just before half time, yellow cards suddenly appear. And then during the course of the right second half, more yellow cards are given than in the first half. Mm -hmm. Is that down to referee fatigue? Is that down to the fact that referees had done enough of talking? Um, and, and you might, you know, you might be sat in the stands and you might be saying to the coach, look, your man's had a yellow card, and I think my advice would be you take him off. Yeah. yeah. So that you're actually feeding accurate technical information into that particular team. Yeah. But I think at the same time, you can talk to the players of that team. You can actually say, look, it's it's better to di dispute a decision from five yards with three of you together than it is one yard away and you're the guy yeah because you're going to get a yellow card the three is going to give yeah. you you know this is this is this this is the the, the school i mean i i i once had a meeting with david moyes they they just they just brought Fellani into the club he was a belgium international terrific player bit of a hothead Sometimes. Ten game, yeah, ten games, yellow card, ten yellow cards in ten games, <laughs> and uh, and the club were getting concerned, and I and I went to Farmfield, the training academy, and uh, out of the ten yellow cards that were going to be discussed, uh, three were uh, ones that were, in my opinion, wrongly issued by the referee, and so I went number seven, number eight, and number four, discard those. You're right. A, a yellow card could have been avoided. But then we got into the realms of why yellow cards, this guy was picking up yellow cards. It wasn't for dissent. It was for uh, the offence of uh, allowing a player to go around him, beating him for speed, and then he was holding him. Yeah. Or he was tripping him. And I, and I was able to say, look, in law, that referee has no option than to give a yellow card. But the outcome of that was that here was a player coming into the Premier League, not adapting to the speed. Yeah. His coach saying, I want you to be a metre away. And he had a, he had thinking time over a distance of a metre. And that manager suddenly said, actually, I'm going to pull him away a bit and give two or three yards. Yeah. And give him the opportunity to think before he acts. So there are practical uh scenarios where uh, a former referee can can yeah. actually assist the process i think it's in very small not, yeah. not with the aim of undermining the referee not but the, actually yeah. improving the behavior and and you know ensuring that clubs are not getting overcut with yellow and red cards that's kind of how i looked at it is i felt this might actually be a way of making the referee on the people i think some people are sitting there thinking he's going to turn on referees and start just <laughs> criticizing it you know the, his for, some of these his former colleagues because he refereed with some of these guys and you know and whatnot and i'm i don't i don't look at it the same way as that you know um especially I haven't read his book i don't know mark clattenberg but i also can't imagine that's his angle here 100 percent. it doesn't make any sense I, I i you know i mean look i'm often critical of referees you no doubt seen and read what i've written um, I say it as it is, because ultimately, at the end of the day, I believe that when I was the boss of the PGMOL and retired from that position, I left I left the game with a cadre of at least ten world class referees. We were regarded as probably being the best set of referees in the world. So much so that UEFA uh, wrote a convention 
a referee convention, which was based on how we operated in England. I was the author, along with Joe Guest, who was Canada's number two for a spell, James Finnegan. We wrote that criteria of a UEFA referee convention, which operates throughout Europe now. And that was based on uh, referee selection, retention, uh, measurement of fitness and regimes, uh, selection, accountability, various other aspects. So, you know, um, and that's improved, I believe, improved the standard of refereeing. But we have, you know, if we look at the programme, we, I mean, we've currently got a Premier League referee that's only done two Premier League games this season. I didn't know that. So. An established Premier League referee. And so, you know, you, you look at that and you say, well, the, these are things that you need to be looking at. These are the things that need to be uh, reaction. So for me, that referee would be off next year. Yeah. Um, I had a uh, I, we don't want it because I know it's getting late over where yeah. you are. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. so let's, so let's uh, wrap this one up for you. But just to yeah, ask, because... Sure. Um, you, so obviously we talked about you founding the you know kind of the, the the full time officials. You also kind of were kind of one of the spearheads of the respect campaign, right? In the early days of the respect campaign, um, I remember, and I had to go back and look at it, and I found it this article um, where you ha there was seemed to be a clash with the league managers association. Um, so I I just kind of wanted you to talk about how challenging that was to put that in place, um, and has it worked? Has that respect campaign worked? If not, why do you feel it hasn't worked? And I think we can kind of leave it there because I know, like I say, it's getting late there. I just want to kind of leave you with that. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I mean, ultimately, um, they always, when I first took on the job, the general view of the playing side and the managing side of the game was a suspicion around referee. We were a close shot. We were effectively policemen, policing policemen, in a sense, not being disrespectful to the police mm -hmm. force. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it was former referees assessing the performance of match officials. And so as a result, I went to the Premier League and said, look, I, I want a team of observers, former players and former managers. Let's have a panel. You select them. You pay them. They can go to the game. They can listen to the referee before the game. They can monitor and issue a report on the performance. I've still got assessors, by the way, doing the same from their standpoint, a referee going in and chatting. So, yeah, two people analysing performance. Um, when we go back to mass confrontation, uh, I encourage the Premier League to put a fine of up to a quarter of a million pounds. For mass confrontation they wouldn't go for points deduction but they went for the potential fine so it had a deterrent effect and then what we had was we we had a charter which was get on with the game get on with each other get on with the referee the manager of the club the owner of the club the captain of the club had to sign that charter. We then said, or I then said, right, we will accept that at the exchange of the team sheet, one hour before the kickoff, the manager and his captain would meet the opposition in the referee's dressing room at the exchange of the team sheets. So we were forming a a channel of communication to the, by way of the captain. We were almost, because law doesn't give much power to the captain in the game of football, <coughs> so we were actually going down that road. Um, <coughs> they, they put on an incentive to the team on fair play awards, the Premier League, and it worked quite successfully for a period as these things do. But it, it lasted a, maybe a couple of seasons. We did wall posters. Uh, I got Paul Trevelyan, the sports artist, to, to draw a, a poster. 
<coughs> and that went in every dressing room. And we did things with kids as well. Um, yeah, you know, there's always going to be conflict on the field of play. And whatever you can do off the field of play to try and improve the relationship, then so much the better. Yeah. And and I think it worked for a period. Uh, <coughs> I think that I travel the clubs regularly, as Howard Webb did when he was boss of the uh, of pro. You know, I set, I helped set up pro uh, with Asher Mendelssohn and Nelson Rodriguez. I had meetings in London. I had meetings in New York. I even gave the title pro to that organization. Um, I think most people know that I was offered the role. Um, sadly, I had to reject it. Uh, I, re I had to reject it because I was under contract with the Premier League at that particular time. Uh, and I wasn't going to break a contract. You know, I've signed a document, mm -hmm. I'm not going to break it. Uh, but nonetheless, Peter Walton came in, and I think uh, with Paul Rigere in those early days, uh, bringing in Alan Kelly and a few others, it, it helped the process. And, and I think it's moved very successfully. And they've done a few things that are better than what we're doing in England. Um, but I think it's, it, it's always going to be the case that, you know, you're, you're always trying to improve relationships. You never give up on that. You're always trying to improve refereeing standards. Mm -hmm. you, there's nothing finer than watching a, a talented young referee out at grassroots level and then, like I did with Clattenburg, and then suddenly going, he's the man. And then watching him and helping him develop his career, guiding him, encouraging him, giving them the appointments to give that level of confidence coming through, um, and then watching them to go to become world-class referees in the same way I did that with Harold Webb. Mm -hmm. You know, as I've, as, as I've done, you know, help people like Chris Beath in, in, uh, in New Zealand and Australia and, and uh, Elvis Nupu in Cameroon, who was at the World Cup. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm now coaching one or two young referees online. Um, and it's great to, see, to watch them progress and be positive. So Mark, Mark Alzi and I have a similar philosophy. I, you know, Mark lives in Spain. We communicate fairly regularly. It's amazing how often we are agreeing in various principles. But we both love the game. Yeah. And uh, we, want, we want referees to uh, prosper. And if there's a shortcut in terms of achieving that or guiding that then that's what we're about yeah awesome um well uh, before i let david close it out i think you know i think the line of stuff we wanted to talk about really was to highlight what you've done for the game through those especially during those 2000s when you took over and you you really pushed refereeing on and into what we're we're now experiencing now i do think it's it's trickled over to the us 100 percent um and and you know we've We've, we're experiencing it firsthand so i just want to thank you for everything you've done for the game and what Pleasure. say done not just in the past what you continue to do right now so um david do you want to close it out absolutely thank you again to keith for coming on and joining us and uh, sharing from his experience and from his plethora of, of knowledge and and overall just wisdom about the things that have been done and are being done and will, you know, can be done in the future to, to help this this wonderful, wonderful responsibility that we have as referees and for the, ultimately the love of the game. And we thank everybody that watches this. We hope that you learned something. We definitely did. And just lastly, massive thank you to Keith Hackett once again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Look forward to joining you again. Thank Take you care. very much, mate. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.